as we ventured down this dirt road, I, I started thinking about this dog that I had seen that morning as we were driving up. It had been laying off on the side of the road, um, and, and as we came around a corner and kept going, it kind of caught my attention, but it, it, nothing really made me think much. But as I came back, I started wondering, I wonder, this is hours later, I wonder if that dog's still there. If it is, you know, I, it, certainly I'll pull over and see if it needs help or whatever we need to do. And certainly, as I was paying specific attention, waiting for this bend in the road, and the dog was still laying there all these hours later. So we pulled over, and about 100 yards up from where this dog was laying on the road was an NTUA truck. Now, that's the um, Navajo Tribal and Utility Authority. So that's our, uh, the power company, all this stuff. It looked like it was an NTUA truck, but it was just about 100 yards up the road um, and facing us, and I could see someone was sitting there watching the whole time that we were out there. So we went over, and yeah, the dog was wounded, and there was a healthy dog standing there growling at me. Um, it didn't seem like it wanted to attack, but it was growling loud enough to let me know, hey, if you're up to no good, um, I'm going to defend my buddy here. And so it was letting me know that, that it was watching me if I did anything crazy. Now, as I was tending to this wounded dog, it didn't have um, anything visible there was no wounds, gashes, uh, anything like that. I noticed that the healthy dog kept running off into the forest, um, and then it would be gone for a moment, and it would come back, and it was always the same direction. And from what I could see, it was the same place, so I started to wonder. I wonder if this dog, who was obviously female, I wonder if this dog on the ground maybe had a litter of puppies. And so I, it, the dog wouldn't let me go with it, so I had to walk off, walk off into the, into, the, into the trees and watch it from afar and see the location it kept going to. And I still to this day have no idea what it was doing. I, it, it, when it walked off, I went over and I looked all around. I was moving brush and leaves and I, it just kept walking to the same spot, smelling around. So I started to wonder, I wonder if this is the spot maybe where this dog was wounded. Maybe whatever it was, a snake bite. I mean, I had no, it was January, maybe not snakes, but whatever it was, maybe it took place at this spot. So anyway, long story short, this wounded dog was in incredible pain. We gave it some water. We, you know, there wasn't a whole lot we could do. We felt awful. We, were, you know, we had great pity for this dog. We didn't know what to do for it. So we, uh, we decided to, to load it up into the back of the truck and maybe go figure something out from, from there. There was nothing we could do out in the forest. So as we started to drive, we got to this truck that I thought was a utilities company truck, but it turned out as we looked at the door, it was a park ranger. And so I, I stopped, forest ranger, I, I stopped and, was, and thought, oh good, this is their job. They're supposed to tend for the animal life and the, and the trees and the things out here in the forest. So this is exactly the person I was hoping to find. And then just in just those few seconds before I rolled down my window and began a conversation, I started to think, wait, they saw what I was doing. They saw me. We were there for an hour tending to this dog, and it was, you could see the dog on the road. Why didn't she ever come up and help out or get involved? I was wondering that. So I opened up my window and, and, and sat there waiting. And we waited and we waited, and she was pretending like we weren't there. You could tell. She could tell we were there. You could just get that vibe from her. She knew we were there. She was doing some paperwork, and she just didn't want um, to help. She was hoping, you could tell, she was hoping that I would just go and drive off. We sat there and sat there and sat there, and finally, reluctantly, she rolled her window down and said, what? <laughs> Here's the conversation that followed. Are, are you here for this wounded dog? Is that why you're here sitting there? Is that your paperwork? No. And then continued doing her paperwork. This dog's really hurts in a lot of pain. Okay. Is there something you can do? No. What can we do about it? Whatever you want. Is there a vet nearby? Near Chin Lee, 
which is, I don't know, 45 to an hour uh, from there. Is that something you can do? Is that something you're supposed to do? No response. Is there someone you can radio maybe or someone who can meet us? Any way we can reach out? You can do whatever you want. Long pause of awkwardness. And I finally said, what do you suggest we do? And at this point, without looking up and without saying a word, she rolls up her window on us. I'll tell you, I was really angry as I drove off. I don't remember what I yelled. It wasn't dirty, but I yelled something. <laughs> something along the lines of, well, you're no good, or something like that, And as we drove off. Really, really upset that... Uh, uh, that this healthy dog on the side of the road cared more, a dog, an animal, cared more for the wounded dog than this human being I was speaking to. Didn't even at least pretend to care. You know what I mean? You'd think you're going to care, and if you don't care, well, it's your job. Well, you might as well pretend to care, but neither. No care, no pretending at all. Sadly, the story doesn't have a good ending. The dog didn't survive the day, and um, there was nothing really any of us could do, but it just, just that lack of compassion, that lack of care, it stayed with me. I don't think I was, I wasn't, I wasn't mean the rest of the day, but I was distant the rest of the day. I was just, I was just not in a good mood the rest of the day, just thinking and brewing on it, and uh, just bothered me. I hate that, that, that lack of compassion left a hole in my heart. And not just for the dog, yes, for the dog too, but for society. This is what society has come to and how we treat one another. It's not just how we treat animals either. It's, it's seen in our planet. Have you heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Floating in the Pacific Ocean is a uh, 80,000 metric tons of garbage. They call it the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's 1.6 million square kilometers. That's three times larger than the country of France. If you don't know France, it's two times, it's more than two times larger than the state of Texas. Floating in the ocean. This is what our world has certainly come to. And so, it, the, these things, these stories made me feel for Habakkuk, as we read a few weeks ago in chapter 1, when he cried out to God. The whole book of Habakkuk begins with, Oh Lord, how long? How much longer? What, what, how much worse can it get? Habakkuk cried out. The wicked nearly have complete control of this world, and even the unchurched sense it. The church and the unchurched, the, you know, our culture today, everyone understands there's something wrong. We've got to fix something, right? Um, deal, there's so much debate today with law, immigration law, gun laws, etc. There's people marching today uh, in Washington, D.C. about gun laws. There's just so much debate about it, and everyone is focused. The discussions today are on law. Law must change, law must change, law must change. But the unwise don't understand that love is the fulfillment of the law. I present that to you this morning because I don't know if the law is what needs to change, but certainly the love needs to change. We have to find an understanding of love again and compassion and mercy. And that's really the genesis or the origin of the issues in today's world. We've got to stop debating law and understand love. So we mentioned last week that in chapter 2 there's some important prophetic symbolism, and I don't want to dis discuss it too much today, but it will help us get on our path. So let's grab Habakkuk, go back to chapter 2. You knew we were studying Habakkuk, so maybe you were wise in putting your, your little Bible string in, in Habakkuk already so you can find it. If not, dig through there and find the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, and we're going to notice what uh, Habakkuk writes in verse 18 and 19. Verse 18 and 19. 
Remember the discussion. We'll review as you turn there. He cries out, Lord, how long? God says, don't worry, I've got a plan. And I'll reveal some of it to you, but some of it will blow you away, and so I can't reveal it to you. It's bigger and greater than you can even imagine. But he tells him, I've got a plan. And in chapter 2, um, he starts to describe the plan. He gives him a vision, and it's just a lot of bad news after bad news after bad. He's describing the, the state of the world in the end. And we discussed that last week, but let's catch verse 18 and 19. God tells Habakkuk in this vision, What prophet is the image that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood, Awake! To silent stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver. Yet in it there is no breath at all. Do you catch some of the prophetic symbolism there? It's like reading out of Revelation chapter 13. We've got an image. We've got people speaking to the image. We've got them expecting this image to change things, right? The image of the beast. They breathe life into the image in Revelation 13, or so they think because God says here there's really no breath in it. There's no power. There's no authority, even though the world says it does. A lot of strong symbolism there that reminds us that this vision, though it for, it, it's for Israel, it's also for us today. So as God is describing all this bad in that day and all the wickedness and darkness in our day, I wonder if you had the same question I do. Okay, God, what are you going to do about it? Where are you during this time? Well, we get that answer in verse 20. Same chapter, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in where, church? In his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. Huh. It's not just something we sometimes quietly sing as the pastor comes onto the platform. You know that song, right? It's important to this verse. It has meaning to to this story. It has meaning. All this wickedness, society's breaking down. Babylon, as it describes, is wicked and terrible and powerful. Where are you, God? The Lord is in his holy temple. We need to know, Adventist family, we need to know this morning that that is exactly where he needs to be. We need him there because of his work there. What is his work in the holy temple? We know as Adventists, his work is the work of judgment. God is in his holy temple. He's watching what's going on. He's paying attention. Why? We know who the judgment, why the judgment is there. We know the purpose of judgment. The judgment is found in favor of the saints. You with me? Is that good news? Yeah. Amen. Judge, he is in heaven. In his holy temple, he's, he's, he's doing the work of judgment. Why? So that judgment can be found in our favor. Because from his holy temple, he has all the tools and instruments he needs to minister to us, to help us, to be in our favor. So yes, the wicked get more wicked. Yes, the confused get more confused. Yes, Babylon gets more authority. However, God is in his holy temple because he can help us from there. Because he's performing judgment so that he can find us in favor. So, as we, as we covered in chapter 2, we want to invite people to be found in that same favor. We want to invite people into the family of God, into an understanding of their covenant relationship with God so that they too can be found in favor for the judgments. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's what God is doing. This is the message of Habakkuk. It's the message of prophecy. It's the message of hope. And here's the great news. It's the Advent message. It's our message to take to the world. God doesn't, he's not just in heaven waiting to smite and strike and to kick and whip. God is in heaven waiting to find people that he can rule in favor for. 
This is our message. And then in chapter 3, Habakkuk mentions that Jesus is, he continues this idea that Jesus is judging the planet, when in verse 6 he says, God is measuring the earth. God is measuring the earth. That's prophetic vocabulary for judgment. Then from verse 6, for the next 11 verses, guess what Habakkuk says again? This world is awful. 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 For 11 straight verses, he repeats basically what God said in, verse, in chapter 2 and in chapter 1. This world is awful. Catch what something he says, though. Chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. We don't find God laying back being lazy. We find God doing something about the wickedness. Verse 8 and verse 9, Habakkuk says, O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation, your bow was made quite ready, oaths were sworn over your arrows. Amen. Selah. World is wicked, world is wicked, world is wicked, world is bad, but God is doing something. God is active here. Uh, Isaiah, I'm sorry, Habakkuk says that God has, a, he has horses, he has chariots, he has bows, he has arrows. What is God doing? Why is God being described in this way? Because you and I are found in his favor and the world is wicked and God shows up with horses, chariots, bows, and arrows. What do you think he's here for? A tea party? He's here to defend. He's here to exalt. He's here to lift you up. He's here to fight your battles. He's here to take care of you. He's here with horses and chariots and bows and arrows. In other words, our God is here to bring victory for his people stuck in the midst of the muck and the mud of sin. Habakkuk even says, is your anger against the rivers and the seas? Habakkuk knows the answer. In other words, God's not bringing his instruments to fight the planet. The planet's falling apart too. Why is God bringing this? It's not because he's angry with the river or the sea. Because he's here to cast blame upon sin and Satan and the nature of sin. So I want you to know today, according to the story of Habakkuk and every other book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you are not alone in your battles. You are never alone in your battle. Any battle you have, but especially in the battle of sin, the battle of pain, the battle of disease, the battle of sadness, whatever it is that's on your mind today, you are not alone. Because in the midst of misery, our God walks as a warrior and a champion defending you. Why else would Jesus show up in the vision with, a, with horses, chariots, bows, and arrows? Our God has shown up to fight, to conquer, to bring victory. God knows your battle. He knows what you need. He knows what's going on. He knows your stress. He knows what is holding heavy on your heart. God knows. He knows and he's here. It's not that he knows and he's like, hey, good luck. God is not a cheerleader cheering from the sidelines. God is your teammate on the field. He's at battle with you and for you. Habakkuk sees all this awfulness. He sees everything that's going on. And then I want us to read verse 18 again. I know we read it last week, but verse 18 one more time. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 18. Habakkuk says this. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Yet, what does the word yet mean when we read it? In the midst of what's going on, right here in it, yet. In other words, there's an answer. There's something else that we need to know. 
All this wickedness, all this awfulness, things are terrible, terrible, terrible. Woe, woe, and woe, Habakkuk says. Yet, even though, in spite of that, regardless of that, disregard that, in consideration of all of that, needless to say, even though, in other words, what Habakkuk is saying in that word yet is that yes, lots of things are awful and terrible. The wickedness and the disasters of this world are great. And you can focus on that junk or you can focus on the reasons to praise. Bad news Wickedness abounds. Good news, Jesus is your warrior. He's here. Oh, Lord, it's awful, terrible news. Yet, even though, I will rejoice in the Lord. Habakkuk says, even in the midst of all of these issues, I will focus on joy. Beautiful, beautiful promise there. And a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge. The prophet sees our day. Habakkuk saw our day. He saw what this world would be like. And Habakkuk said, even if I was in that moment, yet I will praise and rejoice my God of salvation. Now, before we close, I want you to know something from verse 1. Notice verse 1 with me, this, how this prayer begins. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on, and then good luck reading that word if your Bible is open, Shigayanoth. Something you need to know about this word. Theologians, people much, much, much smarter than me, have no idea what this word means. Translators were so confused by this word that most translations just literally put that word in there and they left it alone. Especially historically, translators of, of like Wycliffe and the King James Bible, they just had no idea what it meant. They looked into it. They studied it. They sent it to you know, Hebrew language um, experts and no one knew what it meant, so they just put it in there. The prayer of Habakkuk on Shagayanoth. They just put it in there without any change. All we know about this word is that it's used in one other place in Scripture. And I wonder, and I present to you today, that this is why the word is there. Because God doesn't want you to think that this wickedness is just in the time of Habakkuk. But the fact that God is our warrior is an eternal truth. It was true in the Garden of Eden. It is true to the very last moments of sin and Satan. God is our champion. He wants you to know that, that this prayer of, of this challenge, I should say, of Habakkuk, that we're going to praise God no matter what, is connected to another story. So this word Shigayanoth is used in Habakkuk um, chapter 3, verse 1, and it's also used in Psalms chapter 7. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 7. That's our last place this morning. So flip over there to Psalm chapter 7. The only other place this word Shigayanoth is used. Psalms chapter 7. And before verse 1 in the subtitle, in the subtitle which, which these Psalms of David had, these, these, uh, these subtitles, it says there, you'll see in chapter 7, if, if your version, if your Bible has the subtitles in it, you'll see it says, a meditation of David, etc., etc. The translators were being nice the first time they saw Shagayanath around. And they thought, huh, maybe that just means meditation. So they wrote meditation in there. And then they saw it again in Habakkuk when they got to Habakkuk and they said, no, you know what? Maybe, maybe it doesn't mean because what does that mean? A prayer of Habakkuk on meditation. That doesn't make sense. And that's when they just left it in Habakkuk. So this chapter, this Psalm of David is written 
as a Shagayanoth, whatever that is. But when we compare the themes of Psalm 7 and Habakkuk 3, we see the exact same theme. Guess what Psalm 7 is all about? This world is wicked. It's wicked. It's awful. Enemies are terrible. Enemies are tough. The stress is awful. It's terrible. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. David says over and over and over again. But throughout Psalm 7, he has the exact same hope that Habakkuk had. I will praise my God in the midst of it all. Notice what he says in verse 17. This is how he ends the chapter. Psalm 7, verse 17. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. You see the similar theme, the way they're both ending their thoughts? Whether it was an inspirational song or a, a song that was written by inspiration or a vision, it's the same message. Things are awful and wicked and terrible and stressful, yet I will praise and rejoice in my God. In fact, David says something interesting here. I will praise the Lord, what? According to His righteousness. Is there a limit on the righteousness of God? Does it have a beginning and an end? Does it have a beginning? Does it have an end? His righteousness is unending. Regardless, Jesus came to this earth and he proved the righteousness of God and also the love of God in that while here living in the midst of our misery and sin and wickedness, Jesus lived the perfect and holy and happy life with God. He proved that the righteousness of God is eternal. So according to David, so too is our praise. He doesn't say according to our circumstances. He doesn't say according to this or that. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. His righteousness is unending, and so too should our praise. Even when we feel terrible, and, and listen, we, let me be honest. Praising God in the wickedness, in the midst of wickedness and pain, doesn't always make the pain go away. It doesn't always make uh, the, 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 the stress go away. Just because we say, thank you, Lord, it doesn't mean... Pfft, a miracle takes place. Sometimes miracles take place, but it doesn't mean that the pain and misery or sadness or stress or temptation immediately disappears when we praise God. It's not um, abracadabra. It's not a magic chant, right? But we do so. We praise God according to his righteousness even if the pain continues, even if the temptation continues, even in the, if the darkness continues, we praise God, not because God's ego needs to be stroked, but because it's good for us to remember, I'm going to praise God anyway, no matter what. Thank you, God, for what you have done. Thank you that you're my champion. Thank you that you're our warrior. Thank you that you know what I'm going through. Thank you that you're here with me. Even when we feel terrible, and there's going to be a lot of days when we feel terrible, and that's not, that doesn't mean anything wrongs with us. It's just a lot of days where we feel awful and terrible. Some days we feel like life is pointless. Some days we feel like we can't carry on. What are we going to do? We're going to praise His holy name anyway. So as we close this quarter's theme about um, the lesser known stories of the Bible, lesser known people of the Bible. We've caught a very common theme throughout this quarter. From the unknown, from the mirror darkly that we've been reading about in, in 1 Corinthians 13, as we gaze into this world and we see what the world has, we're going to find joy in the love of God and we're challenged by the prophets in the stories to share that joy with others, to be contagious with our joy. No person, no story, no one, not one of you, none of you are unknown to God. None of you are lesser known to God. 
None of us are small business or a small fry in the church of God. We are all a child of God. And God can use us. God loves us. God knows us. God cares for us. And he wants to be here with us. He is here with us. So let's praise his holy name. We need to watch and be aware. We need to run forward with the gospel. And we need to praise God as we do these things. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much for this wonderful vision that you gave Habakkuk. A small book kind of hidden near the end of the Bible, in the midst of the lesser-known prophets, but a powerful, big message for us today. That in the midst of pain and misery, you're our God. In the midst of temptation, you're our shield. In the midst of the darkness, you're our light. We thank you and we praise your holy name, Lord. Help us, Father, to, to build that habit that as we every, every day, each moment, whatever we're doing, whatever we're going through, that we're thankful and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you for coming today. God bless you today. Enjoy your Sabbath hours and we're going to have our closing song. <laughs>